Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D, and today I'm going to do a little tutorial on using Xtool Creative Space. If you're familiar with my channel, you may have seen my original tutorials for the Xtool D1 a year ago, but much has changed, so it's time for a refresher. This will also be a video where I go over Creative Space for all of the different Xtool machines I currently have, which include the D1 Pro, the P2, the F1, and the new S1. When you connect different machines, Creative Space gives you different settings. So first I'll go over the common items and then break this video into separate videos dedicated to each machine. But I just didn't want to go over everything four times. So you will see potentially a different machine up here and the workable area will be a little bit different for the first part of this video, depending on which machine you're watching this. I also wanted to point out that I am not an Xtool employee and this is not an official tutorial. This is neither paid for nor commissioned in any way by Xtool. I do receive affiliate commissions on the links in the description and a special thank you to everyone who has supported my channel by clicking that super thanks button on YouTube. It's always a surprise and definitely not required, but it's always appreciated. With all that said, let's get into it. So again, I'm gonna go over some of the more common items and when you connect your machine, you'll see that there is a little icon of a machine up here in the top right corner. So at least for the first part of this, if you're watching this in the F1 or in the D1 Pro, these might be a little bit different over here, but later on in the video, it'll all be dedicated to your particular machine. So just some general overall usage. We have our workable area right here. If you press these buttons down here, you can zoom in and zoom out of the workable area. You can also press control on your keyboard and use the middle mouse button to zoom in and out, which is a lot easier to do. If you press spacebar and drag with the left mouse button, you'll move it side to side. And if you just scroll on the button, it'll go up and down. So that's the general overall usage of how you get around on your screen. You'll also notice with the regular work area, you have multiple canvases down here, or you can have multiple can canvases. So if you ever want to do kind of multiple things at the same, or you want to have multiple jobs stacked up in the same project, you can just click on that plus down here and it'll give you another canvas. So let's say I have this on Canvas and this on Canvas 1. I could essentially set up as many jobs as I want inside of my workable area. So let's say I was creating a box that was taking up more than this workable area. And I wanted to have all of that in the same project, but obviously I can't overlap them because I can't cut them at the same time. I can set up multiple canvases to set all of those up in, in a single project. Down here we have the select button. So this when I'm in this mode, I can either select off of a object or I can select onto an object. And then the hand is the same thing as pressing that space bar that I was talking about before where you just click and move it around. So if you have this little hand up and you, you can't click on anything, you have to go back to this select button over here and then you should be able to click on things and then you can move those things around. So up here in the top left corner is the settings. So these are the settings, not for your particular machine, but for Xtool Creative Space. Now, the only things that I really use in here is the unit of scale. So right now I have it set to millimeters and it's set to millimeters by default. Even though I'm in the US, uh, I highly recommend if you do anything on laser engravers or 3D printers, uh, I, I do all of my stuff in millimeters, so it's just far easier. Uh, but you can change that to inches if you would like. Uh, right under that is a hotkey, so you can click on view, and this will open up the uh, the different hotkeys that you can use inside of Creative Space. Uh, it's set up for Windows and for a Mac, so if you want to work a little bit faster, you can figure out all those hotkeys here. And the only other thing that I really do inside of here is check for updates. So if you want to see if there is a newer version of Creative Space, and they, they seem to be coming out with quite a few versions. So this is a good place to check and see that you have the most updated version of the software. So right next to that is the files. So we can either create a new project 
We can open a project, which is opening up a .xcs file, which is the Creative Space file format. We can import an image, which is the same thing as importing an image from here, which I'll go over in just a second. I can save. I can save as, where I save it as a new name, or I can export an SVG. So if I have a vector graphic in here, and I want to open it up in Illustrator, or I want to open it up in Inkscape. I can now export an SVG out of here so that I can open it up in another program, which you used to not be able to do, which is kind of nice that you have that option now. Next to that is a login for cloud. So this is where you can save your projects on the cloud so that you can access them in different places. This is also where you can sign up for Xtool projects. If you want to contribute to that entire community, this is where you would log in for that. You can also log in over here on the right-hand side. So that's kind of in two spots. So for that Xtool projects, when you click on that, this is kind of a community that Xtool has set up. It's kind of neat, especially for beginners to be able to see different designs that people have worked on. You can come in here and you can select your specific machine that you're working on. So let's say you were working on the D1 Pro, and then it'll only show you projects that were specifically made with a D1 Pro. Now, some of these are projects that you can download and, and work on, and then some of them are just in, inspirational files. So for instance, this one, if I click on it, these are just members. Some are put on here by the company. So you can come in here and you can kind of see that the settings that they were working with, and you can open that in XCS or you can download it for later. But this is a good way, especially for beginners of kind of getting your feet wet and figuring out how to work on some project with the machine and get you up and running really, really quickly. Now, like I was saying, there's some in here that are really just more, if it says file, you can download it. If it says inspiration, let me see if, okay, so like this one is a how-to for how to do this Tumblr. And like this one just says inspiration. So this one will kind of tell you what they did, but the, this one doesn't give you a file. I've also seen things in here where there are light burn files only in here, which is kind of odd, but it's kind of a grab bag of a lot of different things, but it, it's, it's constantly getting updated and expanded. So there's a couple of cool things that you can find in here. Again, this is really good for beginners to kind of get your feet wet. Next to that is the announcements. So this could have announcements that Excel is coming out with. This also kind of tells you what is new in the latest version of Xtool Creative Space or what, what has changed since the last time. This thing will pop up when, when a new version comes up as well. So you can kind of go through the release notes of what's changed. And it seems like they're updating things quite frequently. So it's, it's really cool to see what has been different. Next to that is a support page. So that will open up the Xtool support page, which you can browse again by your product. So I'll click on the S1 and, you know, there's troubleshooting guides, getting started guides, maintenance on what you can do. So there's a lot of really good information in here if, if you get stuck on anything. So that is a good resource to have right there. Right next to that is the shop, which will just take you to the website. I don't need to click on it. It'll just take you to the Xtool website. And I already showed you guys, this is your profile if you decide to sign up for one. Now you don't have to sign up for one to use any of the stuff here in Creative Space, but if you want kind of some of those added features, or if you wanted to contribute to this Xtool projects thing, you would have to sign up for an account. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over the left-hand side here. So the first thing that we have here is image. So again, you can click on image or you can go to import image. And when we're talking about images, there's really two types of images that, that we're working with. One is what is called a raster image. And so that would be a photograph. And so what I'm gonna grab is this Eiffel Tower image that I took. So this window will pop up, obviously, if the image is too large for whatever your particular canvas is, sometimes, I like to tell it to display it in its original size if I'm going to be doing editing because it just comes in larger. But for right now, I'll just say scale to fit on canvas. 
So again, this is the first type of image, and this is what is called a raster image. So that's any type of photograph, anything that's not a line drawing. So really the differentiation that you're making here is the only thing you can really do with an image is you can engrave. So you'll notice when I have it selected, the only processing type I have over here, and again, this is for the S1, but it'll be kind of the same thing for the other machines, but you only can engrave with an image. If you have something like a vector graphic, which is this line art, you'll see that I have score, engrave, and cut. So the only thing that you can do with a raster is engrave, and then with the vector image, you can do all of the things. So if I was to hit engrave, it would fill in this shape. If you hit score, it'll just go around the object, kind of draw an outline around it. And then cut is where you kind of slow the speed down and you would cut this out of something. But I'm going to go back to this raster image. So they give you a couple different filters that you can use. So this is just the original image. And also if it's too large, you can just select one of the corners, click and then drag and you can make it smaller. I'll kind of go over that when I go into the size of the things over here later. They, they have a couple different kind of filters that you can put on a bitmap image or a raster image. So we can add a grid. So it kind of puts it as a grid pattern. This is kind of similar to the dithering that, that I'll talk about later on, but this is kind of a, just a one step dither. We can go into sketch mode. So some of these are very similar to things that you would see in Photoshop. So we have a couple different comics and sketches. We can emboss the image and then just set it to black and white. And then with a lot of these different settings, we have a sharpness. So if I go to this black and white, I'm going to zoom in. Depending on which one that you're using, the, the sharpness will, will change different settings. You can also play with this grayscale. So if you move from the top down, it'll take the, the darker sections out. And if you do it from the bottom up, it will take the lighter sections out. So you might want to play with some of that when you are messing with a image. You can also invert the image. So a lot of times when you see people engraving on those kind of metal business cards, a lot of times what you will do is invert the image. It would engrave away all the black sections and everything that's white here would be left. So that would be the black section that you would see on the business card. I can also go into edit image. So when I come in here, I have three editing options. I have this magic wand, which I can click on objects and, and it'll, it'll basically select them and delete them. I'm doing control Z to undo. Now this fuzziness value down here is kind of the threshold that it can select at. So. If I was to turn this way down and select something, you see it, it's only able to select a small section because it's, it's looking for things that are the same value as what I just selected. So if the fuzzy value was really high and it clicks on it, it's going to take away a much larger section. And then next to that is an eraser. So the eraser has a size that I can move by putting in a value or by moving this slider here, and that'll just erase away portions of my image. And then finally we have a crop. So if I only wanted a certain section, I can just click, drag around a section, click OK. And then I have a, just a smaller section of this image. And then once I'm done, I just hit save. And now I have a crop version of that file. Now, if I go back into that file, it's already cropped. So you want to make sure that you meant to do that instead of uh, something that you didn't want to do. If I want to crop this or mask it with a shape, come over here and grab a shape. And I'm just going to place it over my object. Now with this shape selected, I can shift select the image and then right click. And then I can click here. It says make clipping mask. And then I can move the background object if I would like to. I can scale it. I can do whatever I want to it. 
And then I just have to click done up here. And then now I have an outline or a mask of that image. Now this is also editable, so it's not final. So if I double click on it, you'll see that I can have the image back and I can either select the front shape and move that around, or I can select the back shape or a back image and move that around. And then when I'm done, I just hit done again. So this is just another way of creating a, a mask or somewhat of a, a, a cropping of the image that you're working on. So if I was to select a rectangle and then that's what I was using for the cropping, then it, it would be different than coming in here and doing an edit image where this, this crop in here is final whereas the crop in here is is non-destructive so you can change the image or move the the crop if you want to deal with that later and i'll show you later on how to crop an image non-destructively a little bit later okay so under that we have trace image and for that i'm going to actually open up a different file so this is the buster beagle logo which is too large i'm going to scale it down okay so now for this image, when I click on trace image, what it's going to do is it's going to use kind of that fuzziness, kind of a denoising based on how detailed your image is. This works really well with a black and white image. You can also do layering by color if you want to, where it'll give you multiple layers. But for right now, all I want it to do is, is kind of give me a vector outline of this image. So I can just click on save. And then if I was to move it over to the side, you'll see that instead of a raster image, I now have a vector image. So while I could only engrave this because it's like a photograph or a picture, uh, this one I could go in and I could do a cutting or I could do an engraving where it'll engrave everything that is blue. So there might be, you know, certain instances where you want to turn your raster image into a vector image which is the next thing that i'm going to talk about right now so again you can either open up these images which are these are all just jpegs and this one's a png or you can open up an svg so you can open up svgs and dxfs and these are basically line drawings that you get out of something like uh, Adobe Illustrator, or uh, you can even export these out of Lightburn and bring them into here if you chose to. So for right now, I'm just going to open this up. And so when it opens up this image, you, you'll see that each one of these, as I kind of scroll over it, is line data. So each one of these could be selected and moved individually. And if I was to select just a, a certain part, I can engrave that, I can cut it, I can score it, I can do anything that I want to this particular one. But those are the two kind of different ways that you can bring images into this program. And I'll go over some, some other settings that have to do with this a little bit later on when I'm talking through this toolbar here. Uh, but just know that those are the two types that you can bring in. And I'm just going to select and delete that for now. So under that, we have insert. So we can insert a line, a rectangle, or a circle. It's all pretty self-explanatory. If you select it and hit shift, it will do it evenly, like it'll do it at a shape. Same thing with a circle. So you can just select and drag. But if you were to hit shift, then it'll do it at a proportionate scale. And same thing with lines. So if you click on a line, and then even if you're moving it around, you hit shift, it'll do it in 90 degree increments. So you can place these down if you would like. Next to that is shape. And so there's just a bunch of different shapes that they give you. You know, I'm not going to obviously go through all of these, but, you know, just like you were inserting a rectangle or a circle, there's other things that you can insert. So you can just insert a heart and move that around. And now again, this is what is called a vector shape. So you can engrave, you can cut it, you can score, which is just to do an outline around it. And that's pretty simple. Under that, we obviously have text. You can add texts. 
And then over here in the window, you can change that to whatever you want. You can change the size. You can go through the different typefaces. This should be for any of the fonts that you currently have on your machine, plus whatever ones came with Xtool Creative Space. There's different styles for different fonts. Spacing will change out the spacing between the letters. So all this is pretty self-explanatory. Obviously we have the lines. You can also weld these so that there are no longer text files anymore. So once they're welded, they're just regular vector graphics. There's no editing that you can do to that. Uh, I'm going to undo that. And then if you can kind of see here, it's, it's a little bit hidden, but this is for creating shapes. So if you, if you select this and then you drag it down, you can kind of start to curve it around objects depending on where you you move this either to the side you know you can kind of change how how strong it does something like that now as of the this video i don't know of any way of kind of drawing out a path or a shape and attaching this data to that i'm not sure if if that's possible in this program or not if you do know how to do that, please let me know in the comments. But this is essentially how you add text to something. Okay, so next I have this vector shape. And so I can click on this and I can start just clicking on points to make my own shape. And if I end on the first point again, it'll create a, a, a close shape that I can, you know, engrave, I can cut, I can score. Now, if you want to not have just sharp, uh, edges here you can double click on it and if you double click on the point you'll get this little bezier curve where you can turn this into a rounded uh, corner uh, so any one of these can become a rounded corner or you double click again to go back to a sharp corner uh, so that way you can get kind of like you know linear shapes but you can also uh, do nice smooth shapes as well now, Xtool also has this XArt, which is something that you have to log in for, but it's it's essentially like mid-journey or something like that, where you can use text to, to create different pieces of art. I haven't used this myself. There, there are different ways that you can earn points. So like if you if you add something to the Xtool projects, or if you enter in a contest, there's different ways that you can get points from Xtool that you can then use as currency to be able to make some of these AI creations. So if that's something that interests you, that is in there. And then the last thing here is a QR code or a barcode. So if you click that, you can just enter in a website, busterego3d.com, Hit save and it'll give you a QR code that you can then burn onto your product. You can do the same thing for barcodes. It'll just, you know, if you, you can enter in letters, numbers, and it'll give you a barcode for that. So it's just kind of a nice little tool that, that allows you to customize some of your projects. And that's kind of everything down the side. Okay, so now going across the top here for this menu window, we have our undo and redo. So I'm just gonna draw a shape out so that those show up. I can copy and paste just like you paste in another program with Control C, Control V. Let's see, I undo, I can go back and I can redo moving in that. So if I select this and then I click on outline, you can see what that does is it creates an outline around the object that you have selected. This will work with vector images. It'll also work with raster images that I'll show in just a second, but you can just kind of move this. If you go into the negative, it'll go inside of an object. If you go to the positive, it'll go to the outside of the object. If I was to bring in that buster, so if I was to do that on this image and click on outline, it's gonna add it to the outside because this particular image has this white space filled in. Now, if I was to go back here 
and I was to select that and go to edit image. Now, if I was to take out that white area, so now this is an alpha and hit save, and then come and do the outline, you'll see that it'll start to do an outline of the inside and of the outside. So if I wanted to, you know, make a sticker or let's say I wanted to engrave the my buster image, but then I wanted to cut around him, but do a little buffer between where I engraved and where I cut, this is where you would do something similar to that. So, so if I wanted to do something like that, let me undo. I'm going to go back to edit image. I'm going to remove this outer ring and then I'm going to use clear that little ring I have there hit save and so now if I was to do outline you can see that I could create stickers I could create all kinds of things by being able to create an outline around that object so that's what that is for okay all right so next to that is array so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little rectangle here so if I click on grid array, it will, it will give me the number of columns and rows based on the parameters I have in here. Now, one kind of weird thing that I'd love to see the devs do is have this window movable so I can see what I'm working on. So when you're working on something like this, you kind of have to move this off to the side, select it, and then you click grid array. And so I can kind of see what's going on up here. But you know, pretty self-explanatory. You change the number in the grid and it'll give you duplicates of your original box. You can also change the spacing between the two. So yeah, that's pretty simple. Hit OK. Select and delete these. You can also do a circular array and this one will essentially do exactly what it's saying. It'll, it'll give you all of this stuff in a circle. So if you Click on the Y, so anything up and down is Y, left to right is X. So if I change this to 100 and hit OK and zoom out, you'll see that it's kind of created a little bit of a clock here where it went around in a circle array. So that's all that does. OK. But the really cool feature that they've added here is the, the last option in the array, and that's the material test array. So whenever you hear someone saying that you have to do a power speed test on something that you're working on, uh, this is where you can set up one for yourself. So if you have an object here, and then I would say material test array, you'll see here that it makes a little grid for you based on the parameters in here that you can then use to test the laser on your particular objects to see what the proper burning speed and power is. And again, this, this will change a little bit based on the machine that you have listed here. So right now I have the S1, so this, this is giving me a power speed test for the S1. And again, I can change whether I want the max power to only go up to 50, or if I wanted the max speed to only go up to 200. So there are different things that you can change in here. And then once you're done, you can, you can go in here and, and move some of these things by clicking on this either group or ungroup. And so at this point, I'm going to skip over the section right here that says Smart Fill. That's only for the machines that have cameras in them. So I'll go over here to the group and ungroup and kind of talk with this grid. So if you were to go into here and you wanted to, you know, change what this says or move it around, you can come over here and you can click on ungroup because right now this whole thing has been created as a group. So if I click ungroup, then I can come in here and select the specific pieces of it. And you'll, you'll see here where this is 200%, 200 millimeters per second speed and 10% power. So if you click on it, you come over here and you see that this is 10% power and 200 millimeters per second speed. I could come in here, I could get rid of this text if I didn't want to see it, or I could alter it. And then I can always go back in here and group it again. And then instead of each piece being individually selectable, I can select the whole thing and move it. Okay. Now another cool thing that this array does, so let's say I had this... Eiffel Tower back again. So I'm going to scale this down really small. 
and again, this might not be the best image for this, but it's just to kind of explain it. So I can click on a raster image, I can go into that array, and then I can do material test arrays. And then in this way, you can kind of go in and not only just see what a regular black dot will do, but you can come in here and change the parameters of what you want for an image. So in here, if I was to ungroup this, you can even come in here and change the bitmap mode that it's being used per image. So let's say I, I wanted to, to do something where this was all using like a Jarvis and then the next one was using a Stucky or an Addison. All of those can be changed inside of here. You can also select all of those at the same time and change those to something else. So anyway, th there's just a lot of things that you can do to be able to, to run tests because you, you know, you can go online, you can find material speeds for a lot of things, but, but really the best way to do it is to test it on your own, on your own pieces, because that's really going to be the only way that you know exactly how your machine in your environment uh, on your particular materials is, is really going to work. So it's really nice that they now have this built in so you can specifically make a grid just for you and for what you want to do. Okay. So the next thing is the aligns. So I'm just going to draw out a couple of shapes here real quick. So if I was to select all of these and go to the align tool, there's just obviously a bunch of different things that we can do here. This is pretty standard across a lot of software. You know, we can align it to the right. One cool thing that I like to do a lot when I'm messing with things is, let's say I want to have this box halfway between these two boxes. I can select all of those, and then you can do a distribute, distribute vertically, which will put it halfway between those two. So there's just a lot of different things that you can do with the align tools. So when it comes to this arrange, say I had this burn logo. So I'm gonna, I'll bring this one in. All right. So let's say I have this image and I'm going to take off the backdrop, save. And let's say I had my Eiffel Tower. So right now the Eiffel Tower is on, is in front of the Buster Beagle 3D logo. But let's say I wanted that the other way around. I could select this, click on arrange, bring to the front, and then now it's over the image. So this is just a way of figuring out the layering of the orientation of, of your images. So next to that, we have the combine. So let's say I have two rectangles here. All right, so if I select these two rectangles and I click on combine unite, it will combine. So wherever it was overlapping, it'll now be a combined or single object. If I select both of those and do subtract, it will take off the second item from the first one. So if I select this one first and then select this one second and then go to subtract, it's subtracting the second item. If I do it the other way, it'll subtract the other one. After that, we have the united overlap. So where the two pieces overlap, that is your new shape. And then the last one is subtracted overlap. Now, you might not notice anything, but if I was to select this and go into engrave, you'll see that this section in the middle is no longer filled anymore. So it's only going to fill on the outside. Now, this really comes into play when you're grabbing an SVG from another, from another place. So again, I have this SVG of a cutting board. And right now, every single one of these things is a separate piece. So even if I was to take all of this and group it, if I was to click on here and hit engrave, you'll see that there's still sections here where, where pieces are overlapping, where that, that doesn't really work well. So if I come in here and instead of, I'm just going to ungroup this for now. If I come in here and instead of saying group, I go to combine and subtract at overlap, what that's going to do, it's going to go through this whole thing. And depending on how intricate your SVG is, it might take a second, but it's going to go through and you see that it smartly subtracted the, the shapes that were inside of other shapes. So now 
this is a much more cohesive piece that I, I don't have to go in and do anything to. I can either go in and I can score around these pieces or I can engrave, which will only fill in these sections or cut. So, so if you ever bring in an SVG or any type of vector file where things are kind of overlapping and you go to hit and this is what you get, th this is why you're getting that. So that, that combined and subtracted overlap is, is how you fix that. And then if for whatever reason you want to mirror the object, you can reflect it horizontally or reflect it vertically. So now with Xtool Create a Space, you can use absolute coordinates. So you can kind of know exactly where a piece is going to burn on your machine. And if you've been following my channel, you'll know that I like to use absolute coordinates with every machine that I can. So even on this S1, I, I burned a grid onto the metal base plate of my machine so that if I want to know exactly where something is going to engrave on, I can just move this to the place where that is going to engrave. And that's kind of what you can do up here with this position button. So whatever you put in here, currently until they give you a way to position other other points is going to be this top left corner so this top left corner right now is currently at x 238.5 so x is the sideways motion and then y is from up and down and so zero is in this top left corner over here so that would be over 238 and down 108 so if i was to change this to 200 and I was to change this to 100. That means that this point right here is exactly at 100, which you can kind of see here. It might be a little bit hard to see through, through YouTube or 200 right here. So that's exactly where that, that image is. And then over here we have size. So right now this is a width of 170 millimeters. Again, I do all of my work in millimeters and it is 150 high. So if I was to change this to 100, so now it's 100 high, and because this is locked right here, it will, it will scale this proportionately. Now, if I didn't want to scale proportionally, I can just click on that lock, and then I can move this, and then this number will change while this one stays the same. Or again, I can move it like here if I want to squash it, but you can only do that if this is unlocked. And again, you'll notice that things will only work when you have them selected. So you can change your settings when something is selected. You can change any of these other tools up here when something is selected. So the next thing would be a rotate. So I can rotate this 90 degrees. And when you rotate, it rotates from the center. It's not rotating from the, from the position up here. It's always gonna rotate from the center. So just keep that in mind. Even if you were to select this point up here, which um, is also a rotate, uh, it will always rotate from the center of your image. And then the last thing over here is corner radius. So let's say I drew out a rectangle. And then over here, I can change the corner radius, which will add a little bit of a, of a fillet to the uh to the end so that it, you know if i wanted a rounded box uh, i could get that versus uh versus a square one and so that's what this corner radius does over here so now the last thing that i want to get into before i get into the specifics for each individual machine is the layers tab now this is something that's fairly new to uh creative space which is very exciting that they that they've added it in here so depending on what I want to do, I might want to have things in different layers so that I can hide things. So let's say I, I create a rectangle that goes around this. And then let's say I also have an image in here. Scale that down. Now I'm just moving this with arrow keys, which is another way that you can move things around rather than dragging. Now let's say on this one, right now everything is in the same layer. But let's say that I, I don't want to output this section here, but I, but I still want it to 
be displayed in this image or in my canvas here. So what I can do is create a new layer and add that to a new layer. So if I just click on it, if I right click here, you'll see that you can copy, cut, paste, delete, but you could also move it to another layer. So right now I have layer one, which is this black. So I could just say red, it'll create another layer over here. And if I wanted to hide that layer, they just added this eye so I can either look at a layer or not look at a layer. Now, one thing to keep in mind with layers and which is something that is a little bit different than this works in Lightburn is when you're dealing with layers in Lightburn, everything inside of that layer will have the same parameters, but that's not really the way that it works in here. So as you can see here, I have a vector image and I have a raster image. So those are two different things that, that this one can, can score, engrave, and cut, and this one could only ever engrave, but I could have them in the same layer. Don't think of layers as, hey, anything in this layer is gonna receive the same parameters. It's more of just a way of, of setting up your scene so that it's more organized. And you can also not have something display or not have something go and uh, be part of the job. So even if it's hidden in here, it's still being output. So if I was to go over to this process tab, you'll see that it's still showing up and what is going to burn onto whatever I'm burning onto. So hiding it does not remove it. It just makes it easier for you to see what's happening. But what would remove it is over here where it says output. So output means send it to the laser or ignore. And if I click on ignore and then go to process, even though it was still visible, it won't show up in, in my engraving. So that's just kind of a nice way of being able to, you know, kind of break this up into separate pieces and, and pieces that are more manageable. Because once you start to have things kind of overlapping, it, it might be hard to choose a certain thing without selecting something else. So putting things in layers to make it more organized is really what those are for. Now, there's there's another thing that I'll talk about in a little bit, and, and it's called the processing path. So you'll see auto planning. And so what auto planning will do is it'll just burn, it'll burn all of the engraving first, and then it'll burn the cutting. But if you want it to be specific about what it does and the order in which it does something, you can set up a bunch of different layers. So let's say I wanted this to cut out very last. I could click and I could move that to its own layer. Right now, anything at the top is what it does first. So I can even select that and drag it all the way to the bottom. So this would, this would go first, this would go second, and this would go third. I can move it to the bottom here. And then if I was over here and, and instead of the processing path of auto planning, I could click on by layer and it'll just burn this section first. It'll do this section next and it'll do this last. So there might be some instances where you want to pick the order in which it does something where you want it to cut out a, a section that's on the inside first before it cuts the section that's on the outside or something like that. So that might be why you want to uh, set that to by layer, but by default, it'll just engrave first and then cut, cut second. But it's really nice that they added this entire layer system. But again, it's, it's more for kind of planning rather than setting. So just, just don't think that because you put something in a particular layer, it's going to have the same settings because it won't. You can also select things and move them to other layers. So, so right now this is in layer two, which I can also name. So I'm going to name this Buster. And if I wanted to move that to another layer, I can select it in, inside of here and I could say move to, these aren't labeled, but you can see the color. Let's say I want to move that to layer one. I can move that to layer one and now it'll, it'll hide with it. So that's, kind of the the layers in a nutshell you can also make this smaller if you want to get it out of the way and that's it
Okay, so now I want to get into the specifics of the Xtool D1 Pro machine. And apologies in advance if my voice changes. I now have a cold, but let's get through it. So the first thing you'll notice is that the picture at the top here will change based on the machine that you are currently using. If you click on this little cog up here, this is where you would be able to switch the device, whether you're using USB, Wi-Fi, or, or any other type of connection. When you first use the machine, initially, you're going to have to hook it up through the USB. But once you do that, you can set everything up through Wi-Fi. So right now I have my D1 Pro connected through Wi-Fi. Go back into here. And in here, you'll also find what firmware version you're currently using so this is where you would check for updates to see if you have the latest firmware with your machine the other thing that you're going to look in here is the working parameters so if we click on the working parameters the red cross is that little laser pointer that's offset in your laser when you first get it i like to turn this off because this red cross isn't where the actual laser is it's about 16 millimeters off to the left of the laser. So I just don't find it to be as accurate. There's even something here where you can offset that red cross just to tune it so that it's, it's more accurate. I find that it's just better to use the laser spot itself. You're going to want to make sure that you have safety glasses when you use this because you're actually looking at the laser beam itself for your positioning. But I just think that that is a, a more accurate way to be able to tell where everything is. This is the flame alarm. You can either turn this on or off. If you have it on, you can change it between low sensitivity and high sensitivity. If you're using this near an open window or somewhere else where there is direct sunlight, sometimes direct sunlight can set off the flame sensor. So you either might want to turn that to low or just turn it completely off. Again, you should never use this unattended, so turning it off shouldn't be that big of a deal. This stops when moved. This is your tilt sensor, so there are gyroscopes in the motherboard. So if you jostle the machine or if it tilts or if it falls, this is the sensor that will stop the laser if, if that is turned on the limit switch sensor now this is just the limit switch alarm so this is if you are going out of bounds of the workable area you'll hear an alarm go off this does not turn off the homing of your machine or the actual use of your limit switches this just turns off that alarm if you happen to get too close to where those sensors are and then down here you can export the elements out of Xtool Creative Space to another program if you would like or or to be used on another laser and this is where you would export that data here next to that little cog that was up here you have this this other little button and all this does is this will take you to the download center of Xtool Creative Space it also you know it takes you to the support page of Xtool so it's just a, a little shortcut to be able to do that. Underneath there, we have the different modes that the laser can work at. If you're just using the laser regularly, you're going to be using laser flat. This, this is just the normal operation of the laser. We also have laser cylindrical. And this is when you're using the rotary tool. So if you're doing tumblers or other round objects, this is what you are going to use when you are doing that. The laser extension kit. If you purchase the additional extension kit, which makes your workable area much larger, this is what you're going to use if you want to utilize that full space. It, it, all of the settings are pretty much the same as the laser flat. It's just extended. And then finally, they just added this screen print. Xtool just came out with a screen printer. And I don't have it, but I'm assuming that this just sets up the workable area so that it, it conforms to the size of the canvas that you can screen print onto. It, it's not even out yet, so 
I'm assuming that's the only real difference is the, the workable area because it, it would have to fit within this screen. Okay, so I'm going to start with the laser flap. So underneath there, you have a list of different materials. So in here, you can come in and kind of get settings based on the materials that you are using. So Xtool also sells a lot of these materials. So they try to give you settings that are, are already kind of tried for the materials. So you can pick any of these. You can also click on more and it'll, it'll show you a, a whole list of materials. It's showing you the ones that they, they know are supported with the D1. There's, there's plenty more, but this gives you a good starting point. I would still recommend possibly running a power speed test just to make sure that you have those values correct. But this, this will give you a, a general idea of what those values should be. And if you choose one of these, when you actually, you know, add in something in here, it will choose that as your reference setting here. So the, the 40% power and the 30% speed is set to this three millimeter basswood plywood. So if you don't want to choose any of those, you can just say user defined material. And then when you go in and, and insert something, let's say like this rectangle, you'll see that it says manual setting here. So it's expecting you to put in your own settings. Okay. Under that is the processing path. So we have auto planning and by layer. And again, auto planning will just, It'll engrave everything first and then do all the cutting passes next. You can also set up by layer. So if you have multiple layers, it'll just do it in the order in which you have your layers, starting with layer one and then, and then going down. And now something else that they've just added, which I'm pretty excited about is they now have relative chords and absolute chords. So they're talking about uh, relative coordinates and absolute coordinates. And if you have watched any of my other videos or my reviews, you'll notice that I always use absolute coordinates. So if I add in a rectangle and I'm on relative chords, no matter where I place my laser in my workable area, wherever it starts, it'll think it, that my laser is right at this point. So whether I have my laser over here in the top left corner, or I have my laser over here, whenever it starts and it says relative coordinates, it'll think that my laser is right at this top corner. Now, the difference with absolute coordinates is once I hone my machine and it's at the zero coordinates, which is, which is in this top left corner, wherever I place this model, it'll no, it has to go from this zero to wherever this point is. And so right now, let's say I want to put that point at 200 by 200. So that means that after I home the machine and it goes to this zero, zero coordinate, it's going to move over 200 and down 200 and hit this point right here. So this is more obvious if I show the grids that I make for this. So if you have a spoil board and you burn this grid onto your spoil board, then you would know that right at the center here, it's actually 210 by 200. So if I went over here and I changed that to 210, now this square is right at that 2 x 210 y200 coordinate. So it's just an easy way of knowing exactly where your laser is going to cut or engrave or do any of those things after you have homed your laser. So if I place my piece of wood right here and I had my design, you know, in this, you know, red square here and I'm using absolute coordinates, once I home the machine, it's going to go all the way to this point and then burn on whatever design I end up putting in that, that spot. Now that again is a new thing that they've added. The way I was having to do it before was I would have to place a little box up here and, and then it would think, okay, well, this is the top of the design and here's a, the other part of the design. 
So when I zeroed it out, it would go, oh, well, there's something up here, but I'm not going to burn it. And then I'm going to come over here. It makes a little bit more sense when I talk about my absolute coordinates. And I'll link a video up to that right there that will kind of explain that a little bit better than, than I just did. Okay, so now I'm going to import an image. Okay. So again, like I talked about before, this is a raster image. And I'm going to go over some of the settings that you can change using the D1 Pro. Again, with a raster, you only have the engrave setting. Right now, it's set to manual setting because if you click off of your image, then you get back to this main screen where you can define a material if you really want to. But I'm not going to define a material. I'm just going to click on it again. This other window will come up. And then in here, this is where you're going to change your power percentage and your speed. And again, you know, you don't want to run different tests to see what the proper power and speed are for your particular material. And down here, it'll show whether you're doing it in one pass or multiple passes. Usually I do all my engraving in one passes, but if I was to be doing any kind of cutting, you might want to do that in multiple passes. And then down here, we have the different bitmap modes. So right now this is set to grayscale. So if I was to process this, and if we were to zoom into this image, what the grayscale is going to do, and you can kind of see the, the different lines that it's going to do, is the grayscale will try to alter the power of the laser based on the, the tone that it's trying to achieve. So if, if something in this image were white, then the laser would be almost at zero. And then if the if something was black, then the laser would be at 100%. And so you're just going to get a variation of the laser power when you pick that mode. Now, everything else in this bitmap mode are what are called dithering. So unfortunately, they don't really give you a, a great understanding of what those are. But think of it as newsprint, where everything is made with, with tiny little dots. So each one of these is a different type of algorithm that will give you shading based on dots. So like if I clicked on Jarvis here, and then I went to process. So if I were to zoom in here, you can see that it's trying to do all the shading by by performing all of these these tiny little little dots for everything now a better way to kind of explain this is i'm going to go back here and i'm going to load a different image i'll load this gradient up this might better illustrate what it's doing so i'm going to process this now based on this jarvis and here you can see when you're in this much grayer or lighter area, the dots are much further apart from each other. And as it gets darker and darker until it gets to black, all of those dots become much closer together, which is giving you the shading. So each one of these different bitmap modes under grayscale are different algorithms for that. So if I was to go into Stucky, for instance, and process, it might be a little bit hard to tell, but you can kind of you can kind of see that it's a it's a little different way that it that it sets up its patterns. So you could just kind of go through all of those. You can even look them up. They're they're pretty generic, and it will give you an idea of what each one of those different modes does. Okay, now I'm going to talk about this lines per centimeter, and I'm going to go back to that Eiffel Tower image. All right, so. When we're talking about lines per centimeter, we're just talking about how many lines the laser is going to do the image in. So it, it, it's kind of like the dots per inch on a, a regular printer. So if I were to process that, if you zoom way, way, way in, you can kind of see each one of these things is a different line. So each one of these things would be the, the lines per centimeter. So obviously the more lines per centimeter, the more of these lines that you have. Now you might be tempted to just go, well, I want as many lines per centimeter as possible, but it really depends on the laser that you have. So if you have the 40 watt laser, you might have heard some people say that 
well, I can get more detail with a 5-watt laser than I can with a 40-watt. And that's really because of the spot size of the laser, so the actual dot that the laser is burning into the material. Now, there are some charts that you can kind of look at, and here's one from Imager. And unfortunately, these are all in, in dots per inch instead of lines per centimeter. But if I was just to tell you what it is, so the 5-watt spot size is 0 0.06. So the highest DPI that you can get with the 5-watt is 423 DPI, and that comes out to 166 lines per centimeter. So you would never, if you had the 5-watt, you would never want to go above 160 lines per centimeter if you wanted the most detailed file possible. Now, if you have the 10 watt, the 10 watt is 0 0.08 uh, millimeter spot size. So that's 318. And then the highest lines per centimeter that you can use is 125 lines per centimeter. The 20 watt is 254 DPI. So the, the highest that you would do that one would be 100 lines per centimeter. And if you had the 40 watt, which is the most powerful laser, but it also means it has the largest spot size, you're at 169 DPI or 66 lines per centimeter. Now, what you don't want to do is go over in that lines per centimeter because then what will happen is if you zoom into here, so this is at a much larger resolution than the 40 watt can do. If you're trying to put too many dots in the same line, the laser will physically go to those spots, but the, the laser spot will be so large that it'll, it'll start to burn into the lines above and below it. So you're not going to be getting the detail that you want you're, you're going to end up overburning on the same spot twice because your spot size is just so large. I kind of explain this in my other video with Sharpies. So, you know, if you're using a 40 watt laser, you have a soft tip Sharpie. And if you are using a five watt laser, you have a fine tip Sharpie. And that, that's really what you are getting when you change these different lines per centimeter. Okay. And then the last thing here is just the engraving mode. We have bi-directional and unidirectional. And all that means is when the laser goes from one end to the other, it'll burn. And then it'll burn to the, from that end back to the other end. If you have bi-directional, if it's unidirectional, it'll just go from one end to the other, stop, come back, and then start burning again from this end to this end. I'm not really sure why you would ever want to use unidirectional. It just takes significantly longer. So I, I always have that set to bidirectional. Now, again, this is a raster image. If I had a vector image, you would still have the score engraved and cut over here. Just a regular power and speed settings and passes. And again, I would go more passes. I, I like to do more passes at faster speeds just to cut down on the charring that happens when you cut with the machines. Okay, so that really just goes over the laser flat. That's just the general operation. Again, anything in laser extension kit would be identical. You just have a larger workable area. And then the last thing is laser cylindrical. This is just say making sure that you have a, a rotary attached. So you are going to unplug your Y motor and plug your RA2 Pro or, or your other rotary into that spot. Over here, we have the two different modes. We have roller. So this is if you're placing things directly on the rollers. And then we have the chuck. So the chuck is that, that claw hand, essentially, that will hold on to your glasses or whatever it is that you're trying to work with you do have to put in a perimeter of the object that you are are using if you put in one it will autofill the other so you either have to know the diameter 
or the entire perimeter if you just measure around the circumference of the object. If you just set up the roller, you don't have to set up any additional settings. You still have the auto planning or by layer, but really when you're using the rotary, I would just let it run it in one path. I wouldn't try to do multiple layers on anything. It's better to just try to do everything in a single process just so that you don't have any trouble going over the same area twice. And you're not going to have relative coordinates when you're working with a rotary. Also keep in mind when you're using a rotary, you want to rotate your objects 90 degrees because it has to be in the same orientation as your rotary tools. And so that's really it for that. This really hasn't changed all that much. I do have another whole video just on the rotaries. I have another video that goes over how to do circles on tapered cups and things like that. So that's a good watch if you want to know how to not make everything look so squished. You can, you can check out that video that I will link above. Okay. So the last thing that I wanted to go over, let me go back to laser flat, is I want to go over the framing. So if you click these three little dots next to framing, it'll show you the speed. So this is the speed at which it will frame and then the light power. So if you're like me and you've turned off those laser crosshairs, this light power is the percentage of the laser that's going to be on when it's doing its framing. So for me, you want to have that just enough so that you can see it, but not high enough to where you're actually burning the material underneath. And I'm also going to make sure that I am on absolute coordinates. And so then I'm going to click on framing. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to home the machine because I'm using absolute coordinates. So it wants to know where that zero zero position is. And then I just press the button on the machine itself. And then once that's completed, you just say framing completed. Okay. So now that I know that this is exactly where I want it, I can go to process. Okay. So over here, it's not allowing me to move the laser anymore or pick the origin point anymore because I'm using absolute coordinates. So it knows that it, it needs to place it where I have placed it uh, on the machine. And once in here, I can just click on start and start the process. Now, if I was to go back here and click on relative chords and go to the process, you'll see that you can now move the laser or you can home the laser, but it, it's now moving from that particular position and you can pick the origin point. So let's say I wanted just based on where my laser spot was, I wanted it to start in this top left corner. If I have everything set to this relative chords, then I can say, hey, I want it to start here, or let's say I want it to start over here in this right. I can click on that, and then that's going to start based on the laser position that I have on the laser currently. It's going to say, okay, the laser is currently here, start here, and then burn this whole thing over here. You can also do the framing from this point, so you can make sure that you have that exactly that the way that you want it. This, you can just move around the laser if you want to, and you can enable the laser spot at that 2%, which will just turn it on. So once you have everything set, just going to click on that process, hit start, and you're ready to go. So that's pretty much it for the D1 Pro. Again, the D1 Pro doesn't necessarily have as many different modes as like the Xtool S1 or the Xtool P2. I have another video already on the S1 if you want to see some of the other features that that particular machine has. I still have yet to come out with the one for the P2, but that's pretty much it. So if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing for more content having to do with laser engravers, 3D printers, CNC, and all things Maker. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.